Our scripture reading this evening is taken from the book of Exodus, uh, reading in chapter 19 and the whole of that chapter. Exodus chapter 19 and beginning at verse 1. Uh, the setting is the Exodus. The Israelites have been uh, taken out of Egypt by the hand of God. Uh, they have been shielded from their pursuing enemies by the hand of God. They've been led safely through the Red Sea by the hand of God. He has led them into the wilderness again by his own mighty hand. And, and they find themselves confronted by an experience of the presence of God that made them tremble. And this is the backdrop um, to the commandment that we'll be looking at this evening. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord wilt not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Exodus 19 from verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim, and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they camped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall build, be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called to the elders of the people, and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. But Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned. Or shot, whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go, do not go near a woman. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up the mount, to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down 
and come up bringing Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. So far the reading of God's holy and inerrant word and we are assured of his promise that by his spirit he'll give understanding and enable us to not only receive his word but to practice his word in faith and obedience. Well please uh, turn in your Bibles to the following chapter from the one that we read, Exodus chapter 20. We're back in the Ten Commandments. We this evening are in verse 7 as it's listed here uh, in this chapter where in the third commandment God declares you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What's in a name? It's one of those somewhat frivolous comments that we make um, that's often used as an excuse for um, bandying around a name of a person in ridicule or um, pouring scorn on the name of an institution for some reason and somebody challenges us on what right of you to besmirch the name of another individual or to uh, besmirch the name of uh, an institution and, and the retort is well what's in a name it's only a label it's just a handle by which we know people and uh, become aware of them and it's very easy to do that that we reduce names to nothing more than empty labels but when it comes to the name of God we find ourselves on an altogether different playing field because God who is above all and over all God who is from everlasting to everlasting God who is beyond all human thought or comprehension has made himself known by a variety of names and he says, you shall not take my name in vain. You shall not regard it lightly. You shall not use it flippantly. But you shall respect and uphold the honor that is bound up with my name in all its manifold revelations. Just reminding ourselves of the cohesion of the Ten Commandments. These are not... Ten discrete commands um, that that are not related to each other. They are um, they are part of a whole. They hang together. Um, the the significance and the demands of each one is bound up with the significance and demands that they have together as a whole. That's why the ten can be reduced to the two. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind. And we are to love our neighbour as ourself. Um, that the, the detail of the ten is expressed wonderfully in the simplicity and yet the depth of those two commands to love. If the first command tells us who we are to worship, we are to have no other gods before God. And the second tells us how we are to worship, not by means of images or idols um, or of bowing down to man-made uh, entities, then the third, continuing in that same vein, speaks to us primarily of our attitude in worship. Our attitude in worship. So often when we were children, um, certainly as children who lived in an age when we were taught the Ten Commandments in school, if our teacher made any attempt to explain the Ten Commandments and they came to the Third Commandment, they would almost invariably say, you're not allowed to swear. You're not allowed to use God's name as a blasphemy. And that's true, and that certainly is embedded, but that's only a tiny detail in the much larger significance that is bound up with this particular command. Quite simply, we are to take God seriously. That's why we had our call to worship this evening from Habakkuk. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth 
keep silence before him. The vision of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, whether it was um, in the actual temple um, that this occurred uh, and he was seeing it through different eyes or whether it was simply in a vision that he had somewhere else that was located in the temple uh, where, where he was taken in this visionary form. And so he said, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and the heavenly beings were flying and they were crying to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. And, and the holy beings covered their faces in the presence of glory. That, 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 that Isaiah the prophet, this man of God, who in so many ways had a more intimate experience of God than any other human being at his time, when he found himself face to face with God, even in visionary form, he, he crumbled in the presence of holiness and glory. Or Ezekiel in that mind-blowing, almost psychedelic vision of Ezekiel chapter 1, the vision that was given to him, a vision of God in all his majesty, mind-blowing majesty, what happened to Ezekiel after that, that vision? He fell down and he was like a dead man for seven days. He couldn't get up. To be in the presence of holiness was utterly overwhelming. It's not hard to, to see how this command does have bearing on the misuse of God's name as a mere swear word or in flippant speech. That's clearly a symptom of how the vast majority of people do not take, people, take God seriously these days. It's, it's, it's a tragedy, an absolute tragedy, that, that no matter where you go, whether you turn on your television um, or, or whether you, whether you um, get on public transport or you're moving around in a public place, that you're not, you can't help but overhear what's being said around you and you can't help hear the name of the Lord being treated as a blasphemy. And, and it's a reflection of the godlessness of our society in this modern age. But we need to see, we need to realize this. This command and all the commands collectively were given primarily to people who claimed to be God's people. People who, upon whom God had placed his name they were identified, singled out from all the nations as being mine, says the Lord, and my honor is bound up with you, your conduct, your worship, and your witness. And in that sense, we too, as God's people in this present age, who if we are called Christians, which is the label that the New Testament church had placed by pagans upon them because they were seen to be manifestly Christ-like in Antioch. And that was the nickname that was applied to them. What was intended to be a slur became a badge of honor, and it's stuck ever since. But if we bear the name of the incarnate Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, then the honor of the incarnate Son is bound up with our life, our conduct, and our demeanor before him and before the watching world. Let's, ex let's explore then some key ways in which we need to have a reverent view of God and what it means to take him seriously. First of all, we must take him seriously because of what he is in himself. Because of what he is in himself, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We need to start by appreciating the connection between a name and a person. The person of whom we speak is especially. Um, this is, they're not just, the name is not just letters on a page or signs in an ear. Um, when, when the Bible uses names of people and, and, and we go through especially the Old Testament discovering uh, the names that were applied to individuals at birth um, that, that more often than not those names had significance and they were meant to reflect uh, characteristics that were bound up with their person and their, their life so we were looking at the book of Ruth recently and the name Naomi means pleasant one and after the bitterness of her experience in Moab and the, the, the 
pain with which she came back to Bethlehem in a sense of loss and shame, she tells her, her kinsfolk in, in Bethlehem, do not call me Naomi any longer because you're to call me Mara, which means bitter. The pleasantness of my life has been swapped for the bitterness of experience these past 10 years and longer. Or again, you find um, names being changed. Um, the most obvious one being the, uh, the name of, of, um, of Cephas, um, the, the first disciple that Jesus called. Um, you shall no longer be Cephas, but you shall be Peter, because you are the rock. Um, and, and Jesus wanted this name change in part to reflect the, the, the brash character of Peter. He was one of those um, to-the-front individuals, the, the natural leader um, who commanded attention and, and, uh, and not a few times commanded ridicule because of his foolishness and failure. But nevertheless, he was clearly a man with leadership cap capabilities. And, and Peter said, you should become Peter. He wasn't appointing him as the, the head of the apostolic band, but he became the de facto head, spokesman, leader of that little group. But the name change was a, a reflection of the conversion of Cephas to Peter when he met Jesus. It follows then that the way we use a person's name reflects the way we regard the individual concerned. You only have to, to think of the way that the very mention of a name um, has a subconscious impact upon us, for good or ill. Um, we had a, an interesting case of, of um, one person from our congregation, um, I'll not tell you where, who transferred to another congregation, I'll not tell you where, um, but the minister of the other congregation was duly warned of what to expect whenever this person made the transfer. He said, no, that couldn't be true. Um, but rang me up within weeks and said, I wish I'd listened. Um, because the very mention of the name sent shivers down his back in terms of what this individual was capable of doing. And, and, and if, that, if that's the case, that if, if the mention of a name will either trigger a, a response, a, a mental response of respect or contempt or indifference, um, that in itself says there's power in a name to trigger a response from those who are confronted with it. And if that's the case at a human level, then how much more with God, supremely? He wants us to appreciate the link between his name and his nature and his character. So the mention of his name should immediately trigger all those thoughts, not just of the mystery of his being, but the glory of his attributes, the, the spine-chilling um, seriousness of his justice that we must answer to him as the judge of all the earth. He knows our thoughts, he knows our hearts. There, there can be no indifference in the presence of God if we have appreciated him as he's made himself known by his name and in his word. Indeed, God goes as far as singling out one particular name by which he has made himself known, which uniquely inspires awe and wonder. He is the Lord your God. He is Yahweh, Jehovah, the name by which God, which God himself defines as meaning I am that I am. It will come later on in the Exodus record. Moses is, uh, or it sort of came earlier on in the, in the Exodus record whenever Moses was told by God, speaking from the burning bush, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And, and, and Moses protested and said, that's, that's a, a death mission. I'll not emerge alive from that. And, and, and eventually Moses is persuaded and he says to God, well, who shall I say has sent me? And God says, Yahweh, Jehovah. That Hebrew, what scholars call the tetragrammaton, it's simply four consonants in the Hebrew language. But a word that was so revered in the Hebrew context that Jews would not take that name upon their lips. If a scribe was going to write it down, copying the scriptures, he would go into the closet to do it. 
um, in order to, to, as a mark of, of awe and wonder before the very written name of God. Um, but, but when God explained the meaning of that name, it means, because it's taken from the, the roots of the Hebrew word to be, and it, and, it, and it means basically, I am that I am, or I will be what I will be. I, am, I exist. I am the ultimate existence. Self-existent, self-sufficient, sovereign, saviour, God. And there is, as we've already been reminded, no being in all the universe to whom he can be compared. So it shouldn't surprise us then that the Bible's book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs, and the use of the word wisdom in the book of Proverbs is skill for living, chokmah. It's a Hebrew word that speaks about um, not just knowledge and information, but how to use that. How to use it wisely and well. How to use it not just for your own good, but for the good of your family. How to use it for the good of society. How to use it to the, to the, the maximum that wherever God has placed you and called you to work, that you need skill for, for living. It's amazing the number of people who have got a lot of intelligence, but they are very foolish in the way that they try to live and relate to those around them. But the Bible's book of wisdom, Proverbs, tells us that the beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. Reverence for God. Awe and wonder at the very thought of him. A wise outlook on the course of life that lies before us starts with serious respect for God. That's why the Bible says to young people, remember your creator when you're young. Don't think of it simply as stuff you hear in church or in Sunday school or you read in books that is interesting. No, reverence for God, taking God seriously is the only place to start if you are to live wisely and well in the years that lie ahead. We need to recognize him and revere him for who he is. We need to hear his name, and when we hear his name, we should immediately think of what he's like. And we are overwhelmed by the sense of might and majesty bound up with God. It speaks also of how we react to God in the way that he has revealed himself in his revelation. We only appreciate the value of a name when we begin to understand something of what it stands for. You know, so if, if, you're, if you're not a, um, an art aficionado, the name Rembrandt might as well be a cartoon character or the name of a pet dog until you begin to realize that Rembrandt was that great artist who produced some of the finest works of art that the world has ever known. That, that the very mention of the name Rembrandt should trigger thoughts of, of what he was capable of doing, or of Beethoven, or of Bach, or of Mendelssohn, um, or, or of any of these great figures of the, the history of the arts world, um, people who were incredibly gifted and talented and, and who have left a legacy uh, of works that are a testimony to the skill that they had been given in their lifetime. You know, in, 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 in our world, increasingly, we, we use the expression, you know, so-and-so has made a name for themselves. When we mean that this person has built a reputation for themselves, for good or ill. Um, usually in the, in the positive sense of the world, if somebody, if somebody has, has done well, lived well, achieved much, then they've made a name for themselves. And, and they are respected and acknowledged for that. And in a real sense, that's true with God, that the name that he has revealed himself by is not some detached label which simply drops out of heaven, but it's closely bound up with who he is and everything that he has done. And in that sense, he uses the, the singular um, noun name as opposed to the plural of that noun, names, because the name of God is the sum total of everything that there is about God. You, you, you might single out an individual and say, oh, so-and-so, he's, uh, you know, he's a great man or a great woman 
They've got a cr tremendous academic track, track record behind them. They've they're, got um, an incredible public spirit in the way that they have served the needs of the communities where they've been. And you run off this list of, of reasons why they are famous and why they are worthy of respect. Multiple labels. And in one sense, the same could be said about God, because there are innumerable ways in which we can single out the things for which God is famous and wants to be known. But when you realize the wonder of his being, the name singular of God captures every detail, every expression of his achievements and of his majesty. In, in a general sense, God has given all human beings a glimpse of who he is and what he is like. Psalm 19 and verse 1 starts off with the words, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth his handiwork. Um, that, 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 that is John Frame so colorfully puts it, we, we live in a sacramental universe. A sacramental universe. What is a sacrament? Uh, a sacrament is a symbol, but it's also a seal. Um, it's a symbol of something that, that is hard to get our heads around, but it becomes made tangible um, in what we see and what it's linked to. Um, and and, and uh, it also explains the significance that is bound up with it. So Frame is simply declaring in, in, in somewhat... Um, creative language, what Paul declares in Romans chapter 1, that God has not left himself without excuse uh, because um, the entire created order from the stars above us to the world around us to the finest components of matter beneath us, God has left his fingerprints on every atom of the created order, every detail of the functioning of this cosmos of which we are a part. That nobody in all conscience can look out on the wonder of the created order and say, I'm an atheist. Not in all conscience. If they're doing that, they're committing intellectual suicide. Because everything in the world around us, and even the way in which we are constructed as human beings, says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The hand of God is in all that has been brought into being around us. As Graham Kendrick put it in the very first Graham Kendrick song I ever learned, in the stars, his handy work I see on the wind, he speaks with majesty. Sure, he ruleth over land and sea. And, and, and that's, that's the fact, dear friends, that, that if we begin to look at the world around us, no theory from Charles Darwin, uh, no clever words from uh, the, uh, the most popular um, scientist that TV is able to put on show, is able to adequately capture the wonder of God's world and God's workmanship. He's made himself accessible enough to all people of all races to be aware that he exists and that respect for God begins with appreciation of the works of God in the world. At the very least to realize that this glorious cosmos is not a, a cosmic accident, but it's the work of a great creator. But God has gone further. He has not left us guessing. Um, he's made himself known by word in language that we can understand, by deed, in works that can be observed. He's attached specific names to himself to reflect specific truths about himself. And, and the Bible is full of these different angles on God, and none of them exhaust the fullness of who he is and the wonder of what that entails. And that, dear friends, must have a profound impact upon the way in which we respond to God's self-revelation, whether it be as we read his word, or whether it be the way in which we pray in response to his word, or the way in which we sing his praise. 
No matter how well we know the hymns and psalms that we sing together, we should not knock our minds into the gearbox of our minds into neutral and just coast through them because we know the words since childhood. We are to sing other words with our minds as well as with our hearts. Showing that we are engaging with God in this means that he has provided. But of course all of this leads ultimately to his supreme revelation through the incarnation of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one in whom the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. This leads into the authority of God that's bound up with his name. Serious thing to use another name's, person's name falsely um, uh, in order to, to gain influence. Sometimes that will happen. Uh, there, there's such a thing as identity theft these days, and it's a, it's a, a serious crime. Um, people are finding their, their bank accounts being identified by somebody stealing their identity um, and getting access to their, their funds. So it's a serious thing to use an, another name's person in a way that misrepresents the name. So there's a, a connection between the name and the authority that goes with that name. And the Bible makes it clear that there's a, an incredible link between the name of God and the authority of God, and it's a serious thing when we try to abuse that for our own ends. So much so that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns those who use his name falsely, who do things in his name, but not for his glory, but rather to advance their own name and reputation. He says that for them, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment. For Tyre, Sidon, Sodom, and Gomorrah, and for those who should have known better, because of the abuse of the privilege and of the authority of the name of God. This third command not only calls for respect for the authority of God in itself, but it should permeate through the order that God has established on this earth, that we do not we do not tinker with the stuff of God's creation. There's a fine line between um, progress in terms of, of advancing an economy, um, expanding into other countries, um, and rapacious, self-serving exploitation of other peoples and other, other situations in the world. And insofar as it is true to say that, uh, that what is often regarded as climate change does have man-made origin, you only have to look at the, the unscrupulous ways in which big companies, oil companies, mining companies, um, have, have rapaciously destroyed the economies of countries in Africa and other parts of the world, taking advantage of poorer populations to serve their own greedy interests. That's sin. And the damage that's left in its trail is testimony to the seriousness of what happens when we dare to challenge or undermine the order that God has put in place. God's authority is to be taken seriously in all its forms. But also it's true in his family. One of the saddest and yet most common abuses of God's name is in hypocrisy where we use God's name, but we use it in an empty way. We do something supposedly for his sake, but we're doing it for our own ends. Hinted at it already in the warnings that Jesus gave, uh, that, that uh, as soon as we identify ourselves as being Christians in the, before the watching world, we become marked individuals. And the people who watch us from the unbelieving world around will see whether or not we are being consistent with the claim that we've made about ourselves. And people are perceptive. I can, they can see through the bluster of us claiming to be something, but living in a way that is completely contradictory to our claim. At the very least, it means that we will never profess our faith lightly. We've had the joy of welcoming new members into the church not long ago, and we hope to welcome other new members into our church in the not-too-distant future. Um, and and it's, it's a wonderful thing to stand up 
and, and be identified publicly as someone who bears the name of Christ and is numbered among God's people. But if we make that profession, then we are called to a standard of behavior within the family of God in terms of our, in terms of our commitment to the means of grace. All those promises that new members take whenever they're welcomed into the fellowship of the church in terms of attendance, in terms of being part of the fellowship, in, in terms of using their gifts for God's glory in the church. All of those things are serious promises that we make in the presence of God and before the ears and eyes of the people of God. And, and we uphold those promises in our conduct, in the way that we invest ourselves for God's glory in his congregation. But Paul sums it up pithily in the opening verse of Ephesians chapter 4. Live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. We've got the highest calling in the universe, dear friends, and we are to live up to that calling by the grace of God. But lastly, but supremely, God's authority is manifested in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest revelation of God is found in the incarnation of Christ, and above all else, we are called to take Christ seriously. Uh, he was able to say at the, the climax of his earthly mission that he had glorified God by revealing his name. John 17, verse 4, and again in verse 6, by revealing your name. Not simply speaking his name, but through his very incarnate life. He who has seen me has seen God. Whoever has witnessed my miracles has witnessed the hand of God. Father, I have made you plain to those among whom I've lived. Of the Father, of him the Father says, having been humbled for a season, he has now been given the name which is above every name, that at that name every knee should bow. All that God is, all that he has planned, finds its focus and fulfillment in the coming of Jesus as the Christ. And it's not surprising then that the apostles should declare as the gospel began to spread out from Jerusalem, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there is only one name under heaven given among men by which ye must be saved, and it is that of Jesus Christ. One name, one way, one hope, one salvation. So we do not trivialize, trivialize that name. Because not only is it the name of the saviour of the world, it's actually the name of the judge of all the earth. If we do not bow the knee to Jesus as our saviour and our king, then we will be forced to bow the knee to him on the day we stand before him in judgment. In one sense, the wording of this command should make us shudder at the very thought of God's name. It is a name that makes us tremble. But it serves only to, to make us appreciate another great reference to that name in the book of Proverbs, chapter 18 and verse 10. The name of the Lord is a high tower. The righteous run to it. And they are safe. Dear friend, have you seen the high tower that is the name of God? Have you run to that high tower? Because only there, that's the only place in all the universe that you will be safe. Let's pray. Lord, we bless you for your high and holy name, the way by which you have made yourself known, and the way by which we can approach you and intelligently and in a heartfelt way engage with you as you with us. Grant that we may give you the reverence that you are due and we pray that those around us who are not yet Christians may see in us the awe and wonder in which we hold you as the only true and living God and the only saviour of the world. For Jesus' sake, amen.